Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to our weekly COVID-19 update. Uh, today is February 1st, and um, we're going to be giving you some news today on where we are, what's going on. Um, today's actually day 324 of this, this uh, pandemic, this process. Um, we're joined with Sarah Branko, our public health director, and Jeff Smith, our sheriff. Um, give, start off today with uh, just a, a quick look at the numbers. Um, and just for perspective, I'll go back a couple weeks. Um, uh, two weeks ago, we were at 276 for the week. Uh, last week, uh, or the week after, we were at 258. And our most recent number is 237. So we are seeing a uh, downward trend in the weekly numbers. Um, similar to what we're seeing within the region, um, most of the trends uh, in, the, in the metrics are, are headed in the right direction. Obviously, there's some uh, you know, different days. You might have a spike in a positivity rate. That's why you look at the uh, three-day, the five-day, the seven-day rolling averages. Um, you know, the things are heading in the right direction. So that's a good, good news. Um, we also uh, had our call that we always do on Mondays with St. Mary's Hospital, which we're certainly very appreciative of. Um, you know, again, I think, you know, the best way to describe that call was uh, similar to what, you know, I just said is that the trends are uh, going down across the region and that is a cause for some optimism, but certainly not a uh, reason to let our guard down. Um, they certainly do have their hands full in the ICU. Um, but again, you know, capacity isn't an issue. And then, interestingly enough, I, I know you and I had a chuckle um, about it. It's a serious topic, but it just sometimes you don't know whether to laugh or cry, but we chose to laugh. Um, there was an announcement now that these cluster zones that the governor was doing now just aren't going to happen. And if you reach uh, 85 percent or above in uh, hospital capacity, then that's when you'll get restrictions put on you. Uh, any further detail than that, we weren't given, but it's it's just remarkable how something that, you know, we had to do and, and with such a big emphasis now is just, you know, is gone. But, um, you know, regardless of that, um, you know, the hospital is is doing better um, and across the region you're seeing a similar theme. So um, it does appear that here we are February 1st, four, uh, four weeks removed from uh, our last, uh, you know, big party celebratory holiday with lots of gatherings um, and things are are coming back down so um, again a cause for optimism but again not sure we want to let our guard down um, you know related to the vaccine um, we did receive uh, 200 doses but you know we have a whole another set of issues so um, again just for people that are out there um, and you know you see some and you wonder where people get information from but um, all the vaccine that we've been given has been get, has gotten out and gotten into arms of people very quickly. Um, and what's that total up to now? 800? 496. Okay. But we have 300 for there, this week, so we that'll go. bring us to our 800. To our 800. Um, so that's, that's a good thing, um, you know, in that we are capable and we're, we're capable to do a lot more than that. We've had some great talks with the city of Amsterdam. Um, and, and with them helping out with some of the resources and doing some joint efforts um, but here's the new problem that we're having today. And, um, you know, we were told that of this 200 doses, a hundred of it is for essential workers and a hundred of it is for, um, uh, folks that work uh, with, the, with people with developmental disabilities. So that'd be Liberty for us. Um, here, here's the problem with that. Uh, in, in addition, St. Mary's has been told that they can only do healthcare workers. So we had a call with the state just after our um, conference call with the hospital and aired these grievances and these frustrations because um, we already covered a lot of our folks that work at Liberty. Um, there's, we don't even know if we'll have 100 doses to go. Um, obviously, we'll work on that. But the state is telling us that is all you can do. So, you know, they're really micromanaging this. And they're telling the hospital and the county that we can't vaccinate people that are 65 plus and that they need to go to pharmacies. But yet when you ask what the, is the distribution schedule for pharmacies, they cannot give us an answer. So we, don't, we can't even tell our seniors where to expect the vaccine, where to call. We've set up a hotline where we can register people over the phone. We can provide transportation if necessary. We've set up a location that is very accessible. Um, and same thing with the hospital. And we have lists with thousands of people that are 65 plus, yet the state, the, the commissioner of the Department of Health at the state is going to tell us 
that you can only do this and this. So um, that is our mind and our latest um, source of frustration. You know, we're told that the vaccine supply is going to pick up, which is good because, again, just to review for people that haven't been following over the last few weeks, they've opened up the demand uh, to, to a huge audience of people um, and are providing a very limited amount of supply. And we cannot go to the manufacturer and just buy more vaccine. We are dependent on the state for that vaccine. And when, you know, you're sitting here and you're, you know, up to week eight and we're at 800 total doses. And now you're telling us that, you know, must. So this is how it says, how it reads here. In order to further advance the goal, the state's goal of vaccinating at-risk populations, all local health departments must with bold, use their weeks eight through 10 uh, supplemental increase uh, to eligible staff and residents of facilities certified or operated by the office for people with developmental disabilities. So, um, you know, we're certainly not gonna let anything go to waste. And if we can't fill that up, then we'll, we'll take action. But um, it's just the latest in a series of frustrations. Um, we know our community. We have one of the oldest communities in the state um, and, uh, you know, we, we need to do what we need to do. And, you know, having micromanaging it like this um, is, is very frustrating. Um, in addition to the fact that, you know, we're, there's been a number of frustrations along the way. So we've, we've raised that up um, and uh, expressed our frustrations. I know other counties have done the same. Um, but, um, you know, we are going to continue with our vaccination program. We're going to do the best we can and hopefully... Um, this week and into future weeks, uh, we can have some flexibility. I, I'd like to think that we will and we'll do our best. But, you know, at a time when you have, you know, and this is exactly what I said to the state. I said we have thousands of people on our wait list at the hospital and at the county. We're 65 plus that need this vaccine. And, um, you know, you're telling us we can't give it to them. It just makes no sense. So that's frustrating. I'm just going over my notes, Sarah. I don't mean to monopolize the conversation today. Is there anything you'd like to add while I look at um, you know, my notes of things I wanted to discuss today. Sure. The only thing that I'll add, um, just so people know, we are planning on hosting a clinic in all three sections of the county. I know oftentimes we get reminded and reprimanded that we seem to only focus on Amsterdam. Um, however, with the county building being in Fonda, we're pretty much centrally located in the county. This week, we will be hosting a vaccine clinic out in St. Johnsville uh, at a location out there for 65 and older and for school staff and school personnel. And we have worked, only 100 doses was allotted for school staff and school personnel. Uh, and we did give 20 spots to each school district. We have five school districts. We gave each school district 20 spots. That was the only equi equitable way to do that. And then the other 100 doses will be used for 65 and older in the Western part of the county. Next week, uh, when we do get our vaccine, our plan is to host a clinic somewhere in the middle city of Amsterdam um, as soon as we get those. So we're very much able to set the pot up and the clinics up very quickly as soon as we get the vaccine. So I just want to remind people that, you know, at the health department, I am very well aware that we service from Amsterdam straight through to St. Johnsville. And that is one of Matt and Jeff and my uh, initiatives that we will be working with this upcoming week. We said we, from the beginning we wanted a spot in the western part of the county, mid-county, and eastern part of the county, and we're going to continue to do that. We're going to be doing vaccines for a while. Um, hopefully the pace picks up uh, more so and, and, you know, the state, you know, loosens up some of these restrictions. Um, Sheriff, uh, we did get a few pause complaints, um, certainly yeah. nothing like uh, last March, but um, anything new or exciting to report? No, we're still following up on the pause complaints as they come in. So, um, you know, be aware of that, that if we do receive them, we send a deputy out to, to follow up and, and talk to the manager of the stores and talk to the individuals involved if we can do that. Uh, we're approaching second doses for yep. some people, right, from on the first Friday. one you did? Yes, this Friday. So that's exciting, second. and we're happy to see numbers going down. So, um, you know, just communicate and follow, follow the rules if we can, and hopefully... We'll start to get a real good handle on this. Yeah, well, we're doing the best we can. Like I said, we're ready to go. Um, you know, if we got a thousand vaccines, we'd have them out, no problem. So hopefully that'll turn around. Um, just can I, yeah. and one of the other things, just on my way in, um, it triggered something for me. Um, at our sheriff's department and at the public health department, we do have sharps containers for our senior citizens and folks in the community who um, need the red medical waste sharps containers. Um, and it reminded me, Jeff, I need to bring up some empty containers for you to have up here. But we do get some phone calls from especially our 65 and older population asking where they can pick those up. 
please give us a call and we can get them to you or you can pick them up at any local pharmacy or here at the sheriff's office or, or our public health building. We can get those to you and then they can be disposed of at one of those locations as well. Um, and you know, when we're talking about vaccines, it's one of the things that we will be talking to folks when they come into our clinic about is if you're on medications, how do you dispose of unwanted medications? How do you dispose of uh, your syringes after, after they're used? So uh, again, we do more than just COVID. Yes, that's for sure. Um, last gripe and groan before we go to questions <laughs> for me. Um, the whole issue of expecting 65 plus to go to pharmacies, that means a senior citizen has to, um, A, become aware of which pharmacy has it, which has been next to impossible. We don't even know. Um, occasionally, we'll get an email that says, oh, yeah, by the way, this pharmacy is getting it. Um, but then it's their responsibility to sign up, which is sometimes on a lot of times on the internet, which maybe they don't have, and then is a responsibility to get there. I mean, that's just a lot to expect a population that's going to need some help. And from the phone calls we've been taking in the office, which are in the thousands by now, you know, we're seeing a lot of people with transportation issues. I'd like to thank uh, Tony Agresta for, you know, a lot of the um, legwork that he's been doing in the city of Amsterdam as far as, you know, fleshing out some of the detail about you know how we can tackle going into seniors homes that's going to be a big issue down the road we have uh, a lot of people that have been flagged that cannot leave the house so that's going to have to be addressed and you know we're going to try to handle that as a as a team um and and we're working on that but it's just frustrating you know this doesn't have to be that complicated and it's unfortunately being made more complicated than it needs to be so all right i'm sure we got a ton of questions so morgan let her rip when are teachers getting priority for vaccines Th right that now. comes from the state. So this week we had 100 doses allocated for not teachers, school personnel. So when we talk about teachers, it's for school personnel, bus drivers, custodians, cafeteria workers, teachers, teachers aides. So it was 100 doses for school personnel. Yeah, and the frustrating thing there is it's, it's just a piece of what we need. Right. So, you know, you may you make 100 people very happy, but everyone else that didn't get it is not happy. But again, I would say the same advice to everybody, um, you know, especially teachers who are often very Internet savvy and mobile, you know, um, try to get it wherever you can. I know that people uh, have traveled and have been able to get it and, um, you know, certainly keep an eye on where. You know, some of the bigger clinics, um, they have had some openings. And when we're talking about school personnel, you and Dave Ziskin and the sheriff and I have had a number of conversations with Dave in reference to how many employees are in Montgomery County. Mm -hmm. And the number is well over 900. Yeah. And that's teachers, um, secretaries, principals, yeah. bus drivers, cafeterias. So 100 doses is one ninth of what we need. Yeah. When will other school programs such as Odyssey of the Mind start opening up in schools? You know, we had a great talk about that um, with the call with the superintendents when we were talking about sports. Um, they're eager. Here's the problem. Um, you know, sports, you know, the governor didn't want to address it um, for whatever reason. So he punted it to uh, local governments. And so we had a, the you know, the, the duty of making a decision about sports. We did not have the opportunity to make a decision about any of the other extracurricular programs. Uh, Sarah and I have had a number of discussions that we feel, you know, they're just as important as sports. Kids are having a tough time, um, you know, and uh, the superintendents are certainly feel the same way. Um, and uh, it has been a topic that's been addressed, but that's not something that we're going to address. The only reason we got involved in schools with an authority making decision was because it was specifically done by the governor related to a very specific topic. So um, I would encourage people to continue to reach out to their superintendents. Um, they're certainly, um, you know, of the, of the same mind of thinking, and it, they really care about these kids, and they're trying to do the best they can. And, you know, please share your concerns with them, and, and that's the best thing you can do. And we did talk about this, Matt. I, yeah, I really briefing. strongly yeah. feel that this is a social equity issue. Yeah. And I know I took a lot of heat from that because, you know, sports are very high in health regard. Um, but Odyssey of the Minds, Drama Club, Chorus, Band, I feel they're just as important. Yeah. And from a student of a band mom. Yes. <laughs> yes, yeah. very much so. Um, yeah, it's, it's incredibly important. Um, and a, a lot of those extracurriculars are happening. And you know, even if they are in band and chorus during the day, it's one day a week and they're doing, you know, video recordings of themselves at home. It's just, 
it stinks all around. I mean, there's just, we're almost there. I mean, I think we're getting towards the, you know, the end of this, um, but it's frustrating. And there's a lot of passion and opinions. There's a lot of people that are, you know, having a tough time. But it's not something we didn't think about and exercise our thoughts on. Why are we only getting 200 vaccines when they, when they are vaccinating thousands daily downstate? Um, well, it, there are a, lot, a lot of times it's based on population, um, so that would be why downstate gets more. Um, again, we have no control over what we get. Um, we have asked for and put in requests. That was another uh, question I had from somebody. Well, are you only asking for small amounts? No. I mean, we've tried both strategies. We've tried asking for smaller amounts, hoping like, you know, okay, we'll get 300 and we just asked for 200. Um, and then when we just boiled over with frustration, then we just started asking for, I think one of, one of our requests was for 3,000. So, you know, you put your request in for 3,000 and then you get an email like this that says, oh, you're getting 200 and by the way, this is what you need to do. So, um, you know, I would say if you, if a person has an issue related to the way the state is just dist distributing their vaccine, they need to call their assemblyman, they need to call their senator. Um, we don't have any control. We can advocate, we can fight, we can kick and scream. Uh, oftentimes it feels like you're beating your head against a brick wall, but, um, you know, if please, you know, talk to our senator, our assemblyman, tell them that, you know, we need help. We need more vaccine. There's no doubt about it. And people should understand that you and Sarah are doing that every day, too. You're yeah. telling the state. You know, you're fighting with the state. Yeah, you were on the call the today state, right? with Dolores. And, uh, um, I just want to make sure people understand that. Yeah, we're I mean, asking you to call them, but you oh, are yeah. doing it every day. Oh, no doubt about it. Um, yeah. we, and, I, I, and not only do we tell them that, we remind them that we have the ability to do, you know, thousands. And, um, you know, especially if we, you know, pull in all the help that we've gotten, um, you know, uh, from outside partners, but also, you know, um, the latest information I, uh, message I got from Tony Gresson in the city of Amsterdam is they're ready to go. Um, they're excited and, um, you know, they can bring some resources to bear. And, you know, we're all just waiting for those big numbers so that the pressure can ease because people are just, you know, people are getting upset. I mean, it's there, there's a lot of anger. What about people who have already received their first shot and are due for the second but are not on that list? So if you're if you already received your first shot from our health department, when you walked out of here, you walked out with an appointment for that second dose. So you don't need to do anything else. When you come here for your first appointment, we give you your vaccine. You go to the checkout table. You receive an appointment same day for that second dose. So you don't have to do anything. You just show up, hand us your card. We take care of it from there. And we do have our second dose vaccine already in stock. So the state has already given us that. So I know people were con uh, concerned that they wouldn't have vaccine for the second dose. We already have it. What is the status of FMCC vaccination site? The news said it would be a vaccination site, but we haven't heard anything more. That was, that was a vaccination site that was set up by Fulton County, not Montgomery County. Um, we've had some talks with the state about doing one of their pop-up sites in Montgomery County. Um, that so far has not happened. Um, it, it was looking like it was going to happen very quickly. Uh, we mobilized and got resources ready, and then we're told it's it's going to be now kicked. That can has been kicked down the road a little bit. And same thing in Utica. They were supposed to have a site, I think, with you know, like 900 vaccines, and that got bumped down to in the 400. So, um, but yeah, Fulton, the the Fulton County is responsible for the site at FMCC. If we are on the Montgomery County list, will we still be notified? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that list is, you know, we have people working on it uh, every single day. Uh, multiple people. We're still getting a ton of calls. Um, now we're getting people calling for the second, the third time. Um, and what I would remind people, if you're on the list, you're on the list. And we have your information and we're ready to go. Sarah has the information. Um, and then it becomes an issue of when we get the vaccine, we go right to that list. So, you know, I think in a perfect world, we would have <clears> hoped we had you know, over a month, 3,000 vaccines, and we can get through the list. But, you know, when you're getting dribs and drabs, you know, 200 a week, it's it's tough to make a dent into a list. I think it's probably growing faster than it's um, decreasing. decreasing. If the athletes have to get tested, is that covered by the school? Currently, none of the schools have testing as a requirement in the 
the plan. Um, the only way testing would then become a part of the plan is if there was concern, if there was a student on the team that was displaying symptoms, if there was somebody that had come in close contact. So currently right now they're not. And schools are prepared to do testing. And uh, back a couple of months ago when the governor had talked about red, orange, and yellow, all of the schools did set up and prepare to do testing for their students. But right now that is not one of our requirements. So basically, if there's an issue, it'll be handled just like they're being. It's being handled now, where, okay, someone is displaying symptoms, or you were in a close contact with someone else. That person will get tested. If that person becomes positive, it'll likely put the team out, um, and then it'll, uh, you know, you'll you'll do your close contacts and all that from there. I was very sad to see that wrestling is being discriminated against as a high risk sport. If you were allowing basketball, then wrestling should be no different. Wrestling is one-to-one -one for three minutes, and you can clean your skin after each match. For a basketball game, they use the same ball and are sweating and spitting in each other's faces for an hour and a half while sharing the same ball. As a parent of a wrestler, I think that that, that this should be considered. Yeah, it absolutely was considered. And, um, you know, we in talking with the superintendents, there was a very frank conversation about wrestling. Um, some of the, um, you know, data that's out there is concerning about wrestling. Um, and there was actually um, a real uh, wonder if they were going to be able to do it at all. Um, so, you know, in talking about it, um, we, we had, we came to the decision that we came to. Um, you know, I understand it's certainly disappointing for some people. Um, I think I'm confident that we can try to salvage something for wrestling. Um, I certainly understand it's frustrating. We're doing the best we can. Um, you know, it was, you know, again, not just my opinion, it was the opinion of um, the, um, uh, you know, there's only three schools in Montgomery County that have wrestling. Also, another issue is, you know, there was a couple schools that were wondering if they were even going to do it, even if they could. So then the, the kids wouldn't have anybody to play against. And if you look at, um, you know, the rest of Section 2, the majority of uh, Section 2 is not actually even playing sports. So we've we're coming farther than a lot of the district or the counties within the Section 2 have. Um, you know, it's the decision that we made, um, you know, and I do hope that uh, wrestling at some point can get up and moving. Um, I would talk to the coach and the superintendent about that. There were some specific concerns among some of the superintendents that, um, you know, I'm not going to share in this briefing, but they, you know, the, certainly the parents of wrestling can, can have a talk with and, um, you know, take it from there. We're not saying that they can't. Um, we're just saying that, you know, we just wanted to take a little bit of extra caution um, as when it came to wrestling and, you know, we'll certainly stay on top of it as we go for the weeks to come. Will any of the fall sports be starting now that high risk starts, sports are go, especially asking about volleyball? So n n no decisions have been made on any of the fall sports. Our decision was specifically about uh, what we're dealing with now, which was basically basketball, boys and girls, um, cheerleading, just competitions and wrestling. So, you know, it's not like the, you know, for those that are concerned that, you know, uh, that are on the cautious side, you know, it's, it, it really hasn't opened up the floodgates. And for those that, you know, just want to have everything opening, you know, there's, there's, there's some restrictions in place and there's a lot of protocols that they have to follow. You know, this is the hard season because it's all indoors. Um, and so you have to be extra careful as we get to some of the other sports. Um, I know volleyball is indoors, but, um, you know, that'll be a discussion as we go down the road. And hopefully, um, and this was certainly weighed heavy on my mind, is the fact that, you know, uh, which I, I, it's sad to say but we're starting to get used to this, the, the rise and then the fall and then the rise in the fall. Um, you know, it, it is pretty clear that the trends are going and the models are predicting that, you know, things are heading in a good direction. So my hope is that as you get to fall, you know, they'll certainly be, kids will be able to play sports, kids will be able to do drama club, kids will be able to do uh, Odyssey of the Mind, things of that nature. So I think that's where we're headed. I know everybody wants to get there now, or some people don't want to go there at all, but, you know, I think we've tried to take a very thoughtful, you know, moderate approach to things. And, um, you know, that's why we made the decision that we made on, on sports. Again, it's a very small group. Um, and as we head towards, you know, the, the rest of the season, I know I was just having a conversation with someone about whether, you know, what it'd be like to play football in the spring, you know. So, um, you know, I think it's going to happen. I think people are going to do the best they can in the districts to try to give opportunities to kids. We all know how, you know, uh, it's been tough. This thing has been tough for everybody. 
you know, and some of the ones that really stick out for me are the kids that are in schools so that are stuck in their houses all day. You know, they're already on the screens enough. This has just exacerbated that problem. And, you know, so our very young people have really, I think, had it really bad. And then also our folks on the other end of the spectrum that are in the nursing homes and the loved ones that, um, you know, want to visit them. And just while I'm on that topic, um, you know, I know it was brought up in some of the comments and, you know, it's, we really, it's really a shame what is happening in the nursing homes. And I don't want to speak for Sarah, but, you know, I think there's a lot more that can be done um, to try to give people access to their loved ones. And we've had this talk with the state. And again, it feels like you're beating your head. And that's really where you got to call your state legislators and try to urge them because these policy decisions are being made at the state level. Um, those state legislators have control over the governor's budget and, um, you know, have some have much more clout than we do at the local level. Um, you know, we express our concerns regularly and, and fiercely, um, you know, but sometimes it feels like you're beating your head against a brick wall. But anyway, enough of my long answer. Is the Montgomery County list the same list that you put on Facebook that you get emails from the governor? I'm not sure what they mean. I'm not sure what that means. The list like our uh, wait our wait list? So no, our wait list is our own wait list. Those are people that have called the office, spoke to people in my office, spoke to our staff and volunteers. That list is then inputted into the computer uh, and sent off to public health. Um, and if you're on that list, you're on that list. And we're not going to stop until that list is exhausted, but it's going to take some time. Um, as far as the governor's office, um, I'm not sure what the connection is there that the commenter is referring to. But, um, you know, really the two big lists that we have right now in the county are uh, Montgomery County and the hospital. Regents for New York State High Schools for the 2020 year. Question. I don't know. I don't know. Very good information. Too bad you don't broadcast us on a local cable program for those without internet access. Well, we have been doing it on the radio, right? Yeah. So um, we're trying to get it out for people to tune into WCSS uh, Saturdays. Um, it's a good point. Um, we don't have a local like we used to. No, nah, there used to be one out of Gloversville, but I don't, I don't know if that's up and running anymore or not. I don't have cable. Yeah. I don't have cable. You cut the cord? <laughs> cut the cord. Can we separate data for schools, nursing homes, and communities when talking about the positivity rate? That's really difficult. Yeah. So it's hard enough. I, I, just I mean, I can speak this, generally about it. Yeah. I mean, I was trying to explain this to somebody last week. It takes us about nine hours to go through our data sets. And that's one person because you can't have too many people working on that data set. But each day when we get new data and we get new clusters, we have to we have to take all of that data and all of those numbers and all of those statistics and and categorize them ourselves. So for us to then to compile that data and another subset in order to release the numbers, you know, our county map, it, I mean, Morgan worked yeah. on it. It was like a two week project to get the maps up and running. So it's not as easy because we have to go through all of those numbers and assign them to the location of where they are. Yeah. Well, certainly I'll say this. So schools, yes, we've had positive cases, but a lot of the conventional wisdom about schools has held true that they're not really massive super spreader uh, type of situations where because people are following protocols in schools. Again, where we've seen issues are at personal gatherings um, where people, you know, are, you know, more comfortable and, and, you know, parties, get togethers. That's where you've seen those big spreader type events. Obviously, nursing homes have been a big chunk of, of what we've been doing. Uh, but hopefully, you know, as we outlined last week with the vaccinations at the nursing homes, which is separate from what we do, um, that will that will hopefully start to come down. Um, but, you know, it's 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 similar to what we've seen, you know, along the way. Dr. Co posted two days ago that we hit an all time high in Fulton and Montgomery counties for positive cases in one day. Our numbers still climbing. So, OK, so that's where you got to be careful about how you look at numbers, because especially on the Internet, people can take numbers and make the, it look however you want it look. So you can have your opinion and then take numbers and, and to back that up. So, you, yes, we've had some high days. So you can have a day where you'll have a 10 percent positivity rate. Um, and I'm not saying Dr. Cope is doing this, but I'm just saying sometimes information gets out there and it's just a piece of the overall picture. Um, yes, we've had Fulton and Montgomery counties have had some days where we've had 
some high rates. But when you look at the overall trends, um, the thing, everything's heading in the right direction. So, and that's why when I come out here, um, I like to talk about how, what was the look for the week? And when we, you know, when you look at the last few weeks, 276, 258, 237, you're seeing it go down. We were up well above 300. I think we were even into 400 at one point during one week. So we come here every week and really take a, 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 a minute to reflect, look at the information from the week, and then we decide, okay, are we still getting, are we getting worse or getting better? Um, and we're definitely at a point now where the trends are getting better. You're seeing that in the hospital when we talk to them uh, on a weekly basis. There's some easing there. Um, you're seeing that in the weekly numbers. You're seeing that in the daily numbers as far as, you know, cases. I mean, again, if you just looked at last week, one day we had 18 cases and the other day we had 54 cases. So you, you got to, I like to at least look at the week, but um, I can tell you on our control room call on Friday, um, there was a lengthy discussion about the regional numbers as well as the state modeling. Um, and it's, it's widely accepted that, you know, we're on our way back down. Again, a good reason for optimism, but also not a reason to, you know, declare victory and act like nothing's going on. I think, too, when you look at our weekly numbers, and Matt, as you were talking, it just made me think, our two highest days during the week for positive uh, cases to come back is usually either Tuesday and Wednesday or Wednesday and Thursday. And when I look back and I think back of last week, it was the same trend, Tuesday and Wednesday, Wednesday and Thursday. And it's because of when the results come back. So if people are getting tested over the weekend, Friday, Saturday, those test results are coming back typically late Tuesday, early Wednesday. So that cluster where we're not getting data over the weekend are coming in on those two highest days. So it's going to look a little skewed that this was the highest positivity rate. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, because more people are going on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday to urgent care and to providers to get that test or even the walk-in clinics. Yeah. So if somebody goes to one of the locations where it's a rapid test site, and they go on a Saturday or a Sunday, it takes three or four days for those numbers to get into the system from the location. Mm -hmm. So then it looks like those numbers are skewed for those two or three days because that's when the data is being inputted. And then, then you're describing the situation with just the raw totals, but even if you have a situation with the uh, daily percentage positive. So say hypothetically you have um, you know a, a a situation at a nursing home where COVID has spread in the nursing home and all of a sudden the nursing home stops and says, we're testing everybody in the nursing home right. and you have a number of positives, say you have, you know, 15 out of the 40 people that were tested, that can have an impact on your numbers in a community as small as this. So, um, you know, so there's a lot of ins and outs as to when you look at daily numbers and daily percentages. That's why I have come over this 324 days to really look at the weekly numbers the regional numbers, and any of the state modeling that you see out there. And basically, all that stuff says we're heading in a good direction, or at least we're heading in a better direction rather than a worse direction, because there was week upon week that every time we came in here and reviewed the numbers um, for the week and, and talked about what was going on, we were seeing higher um, rolling averages of the percentage positive. And again, that's why you do a three-day rolling average, a seven-day rolling average, because it gives you a better a look at it. Um, and things are getting worse and worse and worse and worse. Now we're at the point where every week it's like, okay, 237 is a lot better than 400, you know, and, and you look at, you know, the last 276, 258, 237. And again, just as for people know, I also get a report um, weekly on testing. Right now, um, we're doing 10 times the recommended average of testing um, within this region. So there's a lot of testing going on. And you can really see the results in the data. And yes, there's some days that are a cause for concern, but I would say that, you know, generally we're heading in a better direction. Sorry for the long-winded answer. Nursing home numbers should not impact the positivity rate in schools in regards to sports. Okay. Um, how many vaccines do we have? How many shots a day are we doing and why? So 800 total vaccines we've received, approximately 500 are out, and we're scheduling, and if I've scheduled uh, the remaining. So again, you know, I saw somebody was commenting, um, and some of these comments sometimes are enough to make you wonder, but that we lost 9,000 vaccines. Um, we never got 9,000 vaccines. We've gotten 800, uh, 800 
um, you know, again, about 500 are already out the door and the rest are either scheduled to go out or we haven't received yet and we have to schedule them once we receive them. So, uh, and when you look to the hospital, I didn't get an update. I don't remember hearing a number on total vaccines, but they're above 2000 by now. Um, so you're looking at really, you know, still in the ballpark of three to 4,000 for the entire county. And we did not lose 9,000 vaccines for those that were commenting about that. How do you feel about people saying we need to wear two masks? So uh, this is, I, I addressed this on the radio on Friday. If, if that is the recommendation from the CDC, that's, that's the recommendation. For me, I tried it. I can't breathe through it, two masks. But it, was, but it wasn't an official recommendation. <laughs> it wasn't an official no, recommendation. No, Dr. Fauci was, was asked the question that, you know, would that help you? And he said it couldn't hurt. It couldn't hurt. Um, again, personal level of comfort. Absolutely. You if you know, can breathe through too. If that's what's going to make great. you feel better and you can breathe with it, you know, God bless you. Um, nobody's certainly saying that, you know, you need you to be to. doubling up. I did see one interesting, um, funny thing on social media with Dr. Fauci had a whole box. <laughs> on his face. On his face, yeah. You have to laugh. Try anyway. But yeah. But that's, that was just from an article. That was an actual recommendation. When should we be expecting more vaccines and will, be, will we be ramping up the distribution? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's the million dollar question. I wish I knew the answer. We don't know. We're being told we're going to be getting, and I'll read it straight from the source, 16% uh, increase in allocation. So that's what we're being told. But my, my thought here when we're talking about numbers, so 16%. Of 100 is 16. That's so 32 extra vaccines. That's 32 extra. The bottom line is the the federal government and the state government are they, whatever is happening at those two levels of government. We are not receiving the vaccine locally, um, and you don't have to look any further than the five o'clock news to see that um, everybody and their mother is incredibly frustrated by this because, especially us, because we're ready to go and we could. All the plans are in place, the resources are in place, the contracts have been signed, everybody's trained, we're ready to go. Too bad this is going to be turned over to the military, because I'm pretty confident the military would just get it out, get it taken care of, and it would be done over. Sheriff, I would not disagree with you there. Think we're good? All right, Sheriff, parting words? Uh, talking to Director Rick Sager a little earlier, we're just going to get some snow, um, so, you know, we're talking about COVID here, but let's not forget to be patient on the roadways. And Rick, what's the latest projection? Eight to twelve. Eight to twelve for the entire county. Centimeters, inches, feet. Inches, dear. It's still a third. It's still a third of the first storm, so we should be yeah. out. Now, Rick, uh, now I notice we're on the edge of it. Uh, could is there still time for it to shift one way or another? I don't, I don't foresee that. No. So all right. So we're looking at a solid eight to twelve inches, um, and it's not going to be anything where we're getting dumped in two hours. It's going to be more of a prolonged. So we can handle that. Um, and again, just, you know, um, you know, I've, our DPW department has reached out to the towns and, you know, I know that, you know, our DPW is struggling with some, uh, you know, short staff issues related to everything that's going on. So, um, you know, hopefully everybody's in good shape for plowing and things of that nature. But, um, you know, yeah. My closing thought today is, first of all, Super Bowl is on Sunday, so please use your best judgment yes. when having gatherings at your home, but not COVID-related. February is Heart Health Month, and uh, this Friday, actually February 5th, is Women's Heart Health Recognition. So um, I'm asking everybody to wear red for a woman that you love to show support for women's heart health. Great. And um, yeah, everybody be safe. Try to enjoy the weather. I agree with Sarah. Keep your keep your gathering small. We've seen it so many times. Uh, people think it's not going to happen to them, and then they're on the other end of the call or at St. Mary's getting a test and wish that they might not have had 15 or 20 people over at the house. So try to keep your gathering small. It's common sense. Enjoy the game. Um, and uh, hopefully, if there's not too many big issues, we'll see you back here Monday. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, please share so uh, we can help get the word out about what's going on and where we're headed. So thanks, everybody. Have a great day, great week.